can take the sign down, no women allowed. Oh, there's one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Where's all the ladies? <clears throat> what happened to all the ladies? Don't they come anymore? Huh? They're listening from work. The men, the men don't work and the women work. Huh? America. A M I R A M E R I K A, right? America. In India, you'll have a program, and it'll be like two men and 5,000 ladies, right? <laughs> All the ladies come to the programs. Men are out working. Anyway, whoever's here is here. Jai Radha Madhava Kunjavi Hari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Gopi Janavala Kirihara Ahari Jai Gopi Janavala Jai Gopi Janavala Kirihara Ahari Jai Kiri Radhanjan, Yusur Nandana, Raja Jana Hundhaya, Yasur Nandana, Raja Jana Hundhaya, Jamuna Kira Havan. Chahi <laughs> Jamuna 
Glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to the assembled devotees. Glories to Sri Guru and Sri Guranga. <coughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Canto 6, Chapter 5 Chapters entitled Narada Muni, Cursed by Prajapati Daksha, text number 25. Techa Pitra Samadishtahan Prajasarge Drita Vrataha Narayano Sarar Jagmur Yatra Siddhaswa Pur Rajaha Techa Pitra Samadhishtaha Prajasarge Dritha Vrataha Narayano Saro Jagmur Yatra Siddhaswa Pur Rajaha Teta Pitra Samadhishtaha Prajasarge Drita Vritaha Narayana Saro Jagmur 
यात्र सिद्धास व भूर व जहां Seja Pitra Samadhishtaha Raja Sarge Dhritavidaha Nayano Sarogyagmo Yatra Siddha Sabhur Vajaha Thank you. Anyone else? Seja Pitra Samadhishtaha Jamavitaha Narayana Saru Jagmur Yatra Siddha Sapur Vajaha Teja Pitra Samadhishtaha Ratsa Ketura Vitaha Anyone else on the men's side? Yatra Siddha Swabhur Vajaha. Anybody else? Janaki Nath? Neja Pitra Samajitya Pitta Sarge Dritha Vritha Narayana Sarur Jagmur Yatra Siddha Svabhur Vajaha Ladies? Neja <laughs> Pitra Samajitya Praja Sarge Dritha Vritha Narayana Saror Jagmur Yatra Siddha Svapur Vijaha Maria Teja Pitra Samhadishtaha Raja Sarge Dritha Vritha Nayana Sarur Jagmar Gatra Siddhanta Purva Te, these sons, the Salvalasvas, Cha, and Pitra, by their father, Samadhishtaha, being ordered, Prajasarge. An increasing progeny or population. Dritta Vritaha. Accepted vows. Narayana Sara. The holy lake named Narayan Saras. Jagmu. Went to. Yatra. Where. Siddha. Perfected. Svapurvaja. Their older brothers, who had previously gone there. Translation purport by His Divine Grace, Sesi Bhaktivedanta Swami Shri Prabhupada Ki Jan. In accordance with their father's orders to beget children, the second group of sons also went to Narayan Saras, the same place where their brothers had previously attained perfection, by following the instructions of Narada. Undertaking great vows of austerities, the, salvas, the Salvalasvas remained at that holy place. Mm. Prajapati Daksa, 
send his second group of sons to the same place where his previous sons had attained perfection. He did not hesitate to send his second group of sons to the same place, well, they although they too might become victims of Narada's instructions. According to the Vedic culture, one should be trained in spiritual understanding as a brahmacharya before entering household life to beget children. This is the Vedic system. Thus, Prajapati Daksha sent his second group of sons for cultural improvement, despite the risk that because of his instructions of Narada, they might become as intelligent as their older brothers. As a dutiful father, he did not hesitate to allow his sons to receive cultural instructions concerning the perfection of life. He depended upon them to choose whether to return home back to Godhead or to rot in this material world in various species of life. In all circumstances, the duty of the father is to give cultural education to his sons, who must later decide which way to go. Responsible fathers should not hinder their sons who are making cultural advancement in the association with the Krishna consciousness movement. This is not the father's duty. The duty of the father is to give his son complete freedom to make his choice after becoming spiritually advanced by following the instructions of the spiritual master. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gena Jana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manopistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Tadanti Swam Padanti Kam Bande Ham Shiguro Shiuta Padakamalam Shigurun Vaishnavams Cha Si Rupam Sagraja Tam Sahagana Ragana Tam Vitam Tam Sajivam Swadetam Sadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitams Cha Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostute Tapta Kanchira Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Suri Vrishavanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Pancha Kalpa Taruvis Cha Kripa Sindhu Beva Cha Patitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirisesa Sunyavari Pastyatyare Satarine Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nithananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gauravakta Rinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare mm. So the duty of a father. Everyone has a, whoever has a position has a duty. But the idea is what is that duty? So we should understand this point very clearly, that whatever position you have, there is also some responsibility and some requirement that comes along with that situation. That is life. Life means to be responsible for where you are and how to make progress from where you are. So in the case of persons who have charge over other people's lives, their responsibility is, is greater. You have to think about that. When you're responsible for someone else and what you do or say in relationship to those persons, make a difference in their life, then your responsibility is very great. And if you miss, then not only do you fail, but you also get a reaction because you affect the life of someone else. Therefore, responsibility is really an opportunity to go up or to go down. <laughs> it's like a double-edged sword. We want to go up, and therefore we must accept responsibility on behalf of our position and on behalf of our of the Supreme Lord. But knowing that responsibility is fundamental to carrying it out properly. So here we're hearing about what is the responsibility of a father. 
of the possibility of a father, as it's, it's explained by Rishabdev in Srimad Bhagavatam in the fifth canto. What is the first word? Pati nasasya, janane nasasya, guru nasasya, namochaye sarva petam mitam. Uh, one should not become father, one should not become mother, one should not become guru, one should not, the word is not, become teacher, temple president, sannyasi, whatever, unless they can, what we say, deliver or move their disciples, children, towards the goal of life. Great responsibility. We don't hear that. People produce children like cats and dogs, and they don't even take responsibility for them. And their children grow up even rejecting their parents. <laughs> and that's quite common nowadays, because the parents really didn't give them the proper understanding of how to make progress in life. Nor are they making progress in life either. So this is animal life, as Prabhupada would say. Simply to beget children doesn't make you a family. And see, just like he says, cats and dogs, they can produce so many children. The litter of a cat and dog is like six to twelve children sometimes, each time they give birth. So if the human beings try to copy that in terms of, you know, excelling in, you know, that type of activity, then it's human, it's just animal life, right? It's just animal life. Or sometimes we see in certain cultures, because people are poor, they produce a lot of children so they can have a good workforce. They can work in the fields and they can do a lot of things, and that way it helps the family move along doing the work they needed. They do that. So this, these things are extraneous to the real goal of life, at best, and somewhat opposite from the real goal of life. So therefore, the Shastras very strongly enjoin and, what we say, warn, you know, don't take on a responsibility unless you can help those you're becoming responsible for. And that's true. Um, because each time you take a responsibility, you should know that you can go up fast and you can go down fast. It's the way it is. You know. It's a double-edged sword. But because there's no sukriti, there's no, what we say, what is that, uh, uh, samskaras? There's no samskaras in the, in the Western civilization. People don't know the goal of life, and therefore they just simply produce kids just... Uh, just to have kids. <laughs> it's a nice thing to have. You have a kid around. You know? He looks like you. <laughs> can have, you know, if you want to look at yourself, you can look at your kid a little bit. <laughs> I have to get a big mirror. <laughs> it's kind of like the Oedipus complex, right? <laughs> so that's not human life. So responsibility comes along with, you know, position big responsibility here, so problem makes that point. Now, it's interesting, Daksha is actually acting according to his responsibility. Prabhupada's in one sense glorifying him. He's producing so many nice sons, and he's sending them to holy places for purification so they can move forward in performing their service to humanity and to, to, to God. But here, Prabhupada makes the point that Taksha, although he's doing this, his mentality, he has a certain result-oriented. He wants to see them come forward and produce children. And Prabhupada said, a father should give all that is necessary, but then ultimately the children have to make that decision in which direction. So just like their brothers, the who is it? Well, the Haryashvas, these, these names are a little strong, it's hard for me, the Salvalasvas, yeah, they, they, they followed in the footsteps of their brothers. And they also met Sri Narada Muni. What did he do? He did the same thing. 
He gave them a chance like he had given their older brothers. And in, in fact, he encouraged them in the same way. And therefore, they had a choice. He didn't force them. And just like he did with the, the younger, the first set, he told them an analogy about the various aspects of the material world and a goal of life. And knowing their intelligence, he let them figure it out and make the choice themselves. A guru or a teacher should not force, but should teach in such a way that those who they are teaching are encouraged by the teachings. Force doesn't really, especially when you can't force someone under over 15 years of age. Yeah. It says that. That's the Vedic culture. When a child is up to five, you don't chastise, but you carefully watch and guide that child in such a way that it moves in the right direction. If it does something wrong, the parents have to be there. But doesn't but to strongly or to berate a child at that age, it should be with love but strong guidance, will cause the child to somewhat have a little enmity towards their parents. So a lot of love in the first five years, that's required, but a lot of concern at the same time. Therefore, we see sometimes in this society, people go to work after they have children. That's the worst thing. The mother should stay with the child at least till five years old. And that way the child grows up very, very strong physically and very, very happy as a child. And he has the care of his mother and the support of his father. Like that. That's Vedic culture. That's the, that is called the, the time when the seed is very much planted in the emotional body of the child. The intellectual star starts a little later in life, around five years old. But the emotional development comes very strong at those, in those early ages. And that's important because if they grow up emotionally sound, you know, then later they can learn so much and be, when we say, a, a tribute to their family and to society and to God also. So, but we don't see that. Daycare centers, send them to the grandparents. You know, we got to make money. Just, um, so therefore, that, that doesn't really, you produce children, but at the same time, we neglect the care of it. We neglect it because we don't know what the care is. We think making money is more important. We need money so we can pay for the children's things. Well, that's another thing. But the point is that without the emotional stability in the child in the early age, the educational ability, which comes around the age of four and five years old, doesn't really develop in the proper way. Yeah. You can see that. Sometimes we see, even in our society, because we have a dysfunctional childhood, we have a dysfunctional youthhood also, and we have a dysfunctional life. <laughs> Somehow we can come to Krishna consciousness, we can change that around. But it takes a long time to read to reverse that, because the seed is so strongly planted at the early age. There's an old saying in, in Bengal, that if you have bamboo, and it's new, young, you can just, it's supple, they use the word supple, you can bend it nicely. But as the bamboo, you know, stays, it gets more and more brittle, and then you try to bend it, you break it. So when you try to somehow or other teach later in life without putting the proper seeds earlier, it's easy to break the person you're teaching. <laughs> so that's what we have in today's world because there's no understanding of early age. And then it says from 5 to 15, the parents should be very strict with the child. Very strict, because that's the formative years where they pick up a lot of association, habits, bad habits, education, so many years. And then when they, if that is done nicely, then by the time they're 15, they're actually adults in terms of mentality. <laughs> like that. And then at that point, one treats their children as a friend. No more scolding, no more chastising, more or less... Just friend. 
because they've done the work in the early age and the child has somehow developed in the proper way. So this is Vedic culture. Vedic culture is the science of how to do everything in the best possible way. Like that. So, therefore, and then Daksha knows that. He's not going to tell his kids what to do. But he's giving, he does have a particular, what we say, mindset about what he wants to happen. He wants them to follow in his footsteps. But they don't. <laughs> And therefore, somehow or other, you know, he becomes a little disturbed by that. Not very much disturbed. So Prabhupada says, training begins, you know, especially within the ashram, in the spiritual, and with brahmacharya. What is brahmacharya training? To train how to become obedient. That's what it means to be a brahmachari. That's the first training. You know, as we grow up, we live in a dysfunctional society, so in order to exist, we have to somehow develop this false sense of independence towards superiors. And therefore, obedience is not part of our culture. And, you know, it means like, do your own thing, be your own man, like that. It's also due to the fact that we're not getting the proper training in the beginning, so there's a reaction for that. So, therefore, obedience is the first principle of spiritual life. And one who becomes very obedient to the temple authorities, to the, to the spiritual master, and to the principles of devotional service. And one that becomes a qualification for education. Because disciple means discipline. And discipline is another first principle of discipline, is obedience. Obedience allows one to follow the paths, what we say properly, like that. And as obedience is there, then education takes root easily within the heart and mind. If one's character does not develop their education, even if you're good at memorizing things, your character will somehow or other overshadow the, your, your qualities, and your education will be somewhat external. External it doesn't take root within the heart, or it becomes its source of egoism, <laughs> and therefore one has to see that the qualities of a Vaishnava is like the sponge which allows for the education to develop really deep within the heart and within the mind and within the actions like that. So this is the process like that. Therefore, education starts with obedience and then training like that. But most important is education and qualities. Without when obedience is there, one can learn the qualities nicely. How to become humble. What it means to become humble. What it means to develop tolerance. What it means to develop patience. What it means to develop what we respect for others and, and not wanting personal respect for oneself. These are all qualities that are we might say fundamental, but also what we might say they are so important in, a pro in the process of learning that they actually are education themselves. As Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, amanitvam, adambitvam. He, when he explains the 20 items of knowledge, he, he says the first item of knowledge is what? Humility. And the second one is pridelessness, amanitvam, adambitvam, ahimsa, nonviolence. Prabhupada's definition of nonviolence is revolutionary in that purport. Would you like to hear his definition of what nonviolence is? You sure? You won't leave the class? It's really a, it's a really a, a shaker. He says nonviolence means to that if you see someone suffering and you don't do anything to help them, then you are contributing to their suffering, therefore you are violent. <laughs> if you somehow or other are insensitive in a situation where you can do something to help relieve a person's suffering and you don't do that, that's the quality of violence. Right? That's the very definition? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's very strong. So he more or less he manifests that that we should preach Krishna consciousness to others to help them to relieve their suffering. Like that. And that's compassion and that is the principle of nonviolence. But these are the qualities that are foundational. So Brahmachari Ashram is a great advantage to really develop everything we need in the practice of Krishna consciousness. Learning how to become tolerant in association with working with others in such a somewhat restrictive environment. Keeping everything extraordinary, clean. Cleanliness is such an part, important part of devotional life. Cleanliness is also described in that cleanliness is two things. Internally, by chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, purifying the heart, and ex externally, by keeping one's place very neat and organized and not living beyond what you need to live. Everything should be done clean, neat, organized, and therefore simple. And then that makes it easy t to focus on the goal of life, you know. If we have too many things, it's hard to keep clean. If there's, you know, if we're not following a regimen of cleanliness, one devotee said, one person says, when I go to an institution, I go to the bathrooms, and if their bathrooms are clean, I know this is a good institution. <laughs> right. They keep the bathrooms clean. That's a sign of what we say, these people have some education. So these things are really very important. So cleanliness is not next to godliness. It is godliness. So keeping things clean. And Prabhupada taught us a type of cleanliness that was somewhat revolutionary, that it's so clean that you can't find any dirt, even if you look for it. That's how clean it should be. And that's, he said, the number one duty of the temple president is to keep everything clean. That's what he said. One time he was, I think it was in the Vrindavan temple, and one temple president, Akshaya Maharaj, his name was, Akshayananda Maharaj, yeah. he had... He was really proud. They had done a maha cleanup of the temple and all the area. And he was showing Prabhupada around. Prabhupada was smiling, said, yes, this is very good. Temple president's, president's number one duty is keep everything clean. And then one, somehow they came to this one area and there was some dirt in the corner. Prabhupada said, what is this? <laughs> the whole mood changed. <laughs> the whole mood changed. And then Prabhupada wasn't so happy anymore. <laughs> so that's the kind of cleanliness that is meant to be within our society. And cleanliness is a form of preaching. It's a form of preaching because when everything is clean and neat and orderly and works, things should work. <laughs> like you turn the shower on, it should work. <laughs> you know, everything should work nicely then it's actually when people come in, they say, oh, these people are really nice. And that inspires people to join and also to stay. If a place is dirty, nobody likes it. Or unkept or neat, unclean, like that. So these, this is a very important part of education within the Brahmachari Ashram. And it's a great austerity, like that. So that's one of the principles. So as we perform all these other duties, then our temple activities, which are hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, will have a lot of effect. Will have a lot of effect. So we have to also be somewhat foundational in our personal life in order to be what we say, able to pro properly execute devotional service. Bhaktivinoda Thakur talks about that in Chaitanya Sikshamrita. The importance of fixing your material needs in such a way that they support your spiritual practice and not take away from them like that. That's very important. So brahmachari life is a great opportunity to learn so many things, develop so many good qualities.
And then, as Prabhupada mentions here, then one may go on to accept the Grihasta Ashram. And then one will be ready to take on the responsibilities that come by with Grihasta Ashram. Because that requires greater, greater efforts to maintain and to, what we say, to proliferate. So, therefore, unless one is trained properly in the principles of brahmacharya, which is the principles of detachment, household life, one can become attached in the wrong way. And in that attachment in the wrong way, one becomes, what we say, fallen. Like that. So, one has to... It doesn't mean you don't like the situation. You have to accept it, work with it, develop it. And also... See it as Krishna's mercy, like that. Yeah. Aversion in any qual in any any particular ashram is not a good quality, or it leads to a different type of attachment. Because wherever there's aversion, there's also attachment, and vice versa, like that. So brahmachari life teaches you to be simple, and simply simplicity is a is a quality that is fundamental to what we say. Humility and detachment. Mm -hmm. Detachment. How, we want to go back to Godhead. And if we're attached to anything in this world, that means that attachment causes us to take another birth. So preparing ours. No one can be free from attachments all at once. Sometimes I think devotees misunderstand that we should be completely detached right now. <laughs> No, it's not always possible, but we should be attached to the principle of enjoying that idea of um, that whatever is causing us attachment. We should be detached from the enjoying spirit. And learning that real enjoyment comes, or when we say lasting enjoyment, comes through devotional activities. Narada Muni knows that. He knows the goal of life. He's practicing the goal of life. Uh, Prajapati Daksha knows it also. But he has a different service and he has a different mindset. And therefore, he's going to, you know, want his children to, to move in a certain direction towards household life. But Narada Muni says, why waste your time? You're already educated. You have good qualities. You have culture. You know, just move towards the goal of life in a very, what we say, direct way. Don't take any detours like that. Basically, that's what he's saying. So that basically is the, the essence of this particular purport, that the father has responsibilities, and it's not the father's duty to hinder the development of Krishna consciousness like that. It should always encourage the child in the right way, and that ultimately whatever the child makes, decision that should be accepted like that. It's not a child anymore, it's an adult. Okay. okay, so these are some points. Any questions? Yes, Jai Jagannath Prabhu. You were mentioning in the beginning of your class that, um, you know, there's five years you showed them love, and then some ten years there's sternness, and then at the age of 16 you become friend. Oh, okay. So someone at the age of 16 you can instruct. But then when we're dealing with... You can instruct, but you can't... It's, you can't force anything. No, it's not a force program yeah. anymore. Right. So that's, that's like clear. But then when you're dealing with like new man coming into the temple, let's say, the ashram situation, mm -hmm. then you can't instruct them. That's obvious because of the training, the mentality that they come into the temple with and so on. At the same time, if you don't say anything... And sometimes say things strongly as well, then things don't get done or they don't get understood properly. Mm -hmm. um, but then if you say things strongly, then people feel offended. Right. They feel that you're not treating them with respect and love. And, you know, there, there ensues negativity after that. So how to make a balance? Because if, right. if they're not, you know, I, I know, for example, you know also, right. you saw in the beginning, Rebati Nalana Prabhu was very strong with me from the very beginning. I mean, he used to blast me daily, I mean, <laughs> like very heavily. 
Yeah. I've never felt any animosity, but I, def- I don't do like that on a personal level, and well, I don't you, think it works also. But on your personal level, you were gr- you grew up really strictly in yeah, your own... Yeah, that's true. That was you were used to that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's true. Sorry. But some people are not used to it. So, <laughs> like that, they have that wayward mentality. <laughs> you know, so how do you make a balance between this, this type of situation? Well, I think... There's an organizational consideration in your question that bef- when one comes in, they should also be trained in the what is resp- what are they required to do and what they're required not to do, and that should be that should be clearly you know delineated and explained what it means to be. The Prabhupada said the temple is like a hospital, not a hotel. <laughs> It's a hospital. That means we're getting cured from our material diseases. So there has to be some, what we say, restrictions and also some adaptions like that. Restriction is those things that are doesn't fit within the temple environment and adaptions means there's certain activities we have to perform like that. Now, but one thing I found, which is somewhat of a deficiency in the management or side is that we don't really let people know what is expected of them. And that has to be done carefully. And therefore, there should be a, you know, a, a, actually a written set of what we say do's and don'ts within the temple. You get, you, you get up at a certain time, you're, you're here at a certain time, you know, teaching punctuality, teaching cleanliness, like that. So that should be mandated. And then when persons go outside of it, you can refer to that. See, this is what it says, and this is what you have. You should follow. That way it goes beyond the individual who's, who's speaking, but it's actually it's there in writing. I've agreed to come into the temple. That means I've agreed to follow these rules. But if the rules are not clear or not, not written, then when things come up, we try to establish a rule all of a sudden. And all of a sudden, it becomes somewhat, somewhat arbitrary, and people don't want to accept that. I've seen that. So, therefore, if you have a nice, you have everything clear, what you expect as far as protocol and uh, attitude, then all that can be, you know, you know. So that's there. You see where, do you see wherever there's success, there's a lot of rules and regulations. You gotta have it. Uh, it's not. It's not. It's. This is the way to actually move people in the right direction. It's not that if someone goes outside of it, you know, they are, you know, removed from the temple. No, just like in Chelpati, to come into that temple is very difficult to get into the ashram. Very difficult. So there's three stages. They have people who live in the temple area, who work and work outside. So they're called, what is it, VT? VT. And then there's another group that are training to live in the temple. They don't work. They're brahmacharis also. Yeah. And then they have the actual mainstream brahmacharis. So when you get to mainstream brahmacharis, one thing that is, if you say no to an authority at any point, you have to leave once. So they know that ahead of time. Yeah. They know that ahead of time. It's not that they're thrown into that arbitrary situation and then all of a sudden they're, they, they're clear what it means to live in the temple and live in a certain, in a certain way. And then there's so many rules. And therefore you see the quality of the brahmacharis are really high class. And they're strong. They're educated. They can preach, they can travel, and they can do anything because they have a strong arrangement, you know. It takes time to develop that, but it has there has to be a system in place. And then enforcing the system is easy when it's in place. When it's not in place and you try to arbitrarily do things, then you're gonna have problems. You're gonna have problems. And then people are gonna say, Who are you to tell me what to do? <laughs> 
You know, when, then, but when everything is written and it's understood and there's like darshans and discussions, then you know, oh, this is what it means to, to stay in the temple. But what am I getting out of it? I'm getting an opportunity for self-realization. So, not just a place to sleep and eat because I don't want to work. <laughs> it's like, you know, that's not the point. So that's so that has to be there. So I would say it's more the more responsibility is on the temple authorities to establish this what we say um, structure, and then when people come in, they know. And those who have been there for a while, they're functioning according to this structure. They're a role model for other people who come in. They're a role model. When you come in, you need role models to show exactly, you know, how it should be done. But things don't work when you try to arbitrarily just create some kind of structure during due to circumstances as they arise. It just doesn't work. People will not follow, and it's natural. Okay, does that help answer your question? Yeah. Any other discussions on that point? Yes. Yeah. What would make you happy? Hmm? What would make you happy seeing improvements in, in the general, least speaking, not like you, very you specific? You really picked a, you had, what would make me happy? Yes, Maharaj. You ready? <laughs> You're not, I'd say, ooh, this is a real, are you sure? Instead of getting that firehouse, <laughs> put the money, time, and energy to fix this place up. Make the Brahmachari ashram a nice place. Give the devotees really first-class rooms that are clean, organized, neat, not broken down. Nice lockers, place to, where they can live nicely, not jammed into rooms like that, and places so dirty. I'd say I put about $100,000 into this building and fix it up. And make it nice. Get rid of the junk, the broken parts. Because you got to live here. It's nice, and it should be nice. You should have all the facility you need to work nicely. These tin metal lockers, they're useless. Throw them out. Get some nice wooden cabinets. Metal's just junk. It's all junk. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's junk. Right, like that. And the place is broken down, and everything's falling apart. There's clothes all over the hallways, and, you know, pictures stuffed this way, bottles this way. I'm just thinking I'm in the Bowery, you know. <laughs> this is, Prabhupada said, every inch of the temple is Krishna, not just the temple room. That was Prabhupada's understanding. He said, every place should be as clean as any other place and organized. Right there. And you'll see the difference. The consciousness will go up tremendously. And people will become more responsible at the same time for, their, for themselves and for others. So, so that has to be there. I mean, you might say, well, this building is hard to work with. Maybe it, but I think if the money is there, that would be a nice project to just fix. And give the brahmacharis, you know, brahmacharis shouldn't live in broken, poor areas and say, well, it's renunciation. <laughs> it should be nice rooms. You know, maybe have rooms where there's two devotees to a room and everything is nice. They have their own bunks. They have their own lockers. It's clean. It's neat. They have a little library there. Everything should be nice. And then they don't want to leave. Right? They don't want to leave. It should be nice. And then they're willing to surrender. But if you have to come back to a dirty area where it's crowded and it's just like, you know, so you got plenty of room here. You just have to fix it up. That's all. Got a lot of room here. It takes a plan. It might be a master plan. So that would make me happy. You asked? Yeah. Because I'm quite unhappy living on that fourth floor because it's so filthy and so broken down that I have to close my eyes when I walk through the halls. 
I mean, that's how I feel. I'm sorry. I'm used to, I'm, I'm meticulous when it comes to cleanliness, and that's the way I've been trained. You know, I'm not ideal. I could be better, but that's, but that's the way it should be. It's actually a very high feature of spiritual life and ashram living. Marari, you want to say anything? <laughs> Marari also, we were sharing this the other day. We were discussing this. He also feels the same way. We need to improve the whole place like that. The temple's nice. You see how nice this temple is. It's a very beautiful temple. Things are organized nicely. But this is just one part of the whole temple. It's the most important part, but each Prabhupada said, the temple itself is Krishna's body. So this is Krishna's heart. But Krishna has other parts to his body too. <laughs> And so everything should be nice, clean, organized, and neat. And to do that, you really have to have a plan, and you have to have someone who is some. You have to have a team to carry it out. So, okay. You asked. I answer your question because that's been on my mind the last few days. As I look around, I just see the same, you know, things all over the place. And, and I can see the brahmacharis could have better arrangements for their living quarters. It's not ideal. I mean, the room next to me where Janaki Nath is staying, I thought, you know, they, it was a hotel that was being evacuated or something. It was, the place is filthy, completely filthy. There's black dirt all over the doors, on the walls, the place. And, you know, I was in one temple in America, and I saw the same thing happening, crowded conditions and dirty places and not being clean. I said, you got to clean it. You're going to get bed bugs. They didn't listen. A year later, they got bed bugs. They had to pay $10,000, and still the place is not free from bug bugs, you know. And this is one of the dangers if you're not clean. Bed bugs come. And bed bugs are very, very, very difficult to get out once they get in. Yeah. And they're a menace. They're really a menace. So, yeah, you have to be so clean. So today, actually, on the calendar, I'm not sure exactly the connection, but I saw it's Kundicha Marginum. <laughs> That's what it says on the 27th. So I just happened to be talking about that. Marginum means clean. Gundich is the temple in Puri. Like that. You have to leave. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, do a maha clean every weekend. Just get the whole, all the devotees and just clean, 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 clean. I know one temple in Europe that it's so clean you would be astonished to think, is this actually a temple? It's impossible to be this clean. It is you can't even find and it's a farm community. It's a farm community. It's hungry, New Rajadam. That place is so clean that you would think, how is it possible? It is even that they have hundreds of acres, and you can't find a piece of paper laying around anywhere on those hundred acres. There's no the only dirt is the real dirt. <laughs> it's so clean. It's it's kept immaculate. It's like that. It's amazing, and all the devotees have that consciousness. Their homes are like that. The temples is like that. Everything is like that. It's spotless, and when people come. So many guests come, you know, they, they notice how clean it is. It's amazing. Uh, I remember it was John Moss to me, and uh, they had fireworks one night for John Moss because they were you know, just fireworks to kind of like part of the program. So the next day I was sitting with Shiva Ram Maharaj. We were taking lunch together. And I happened to be taking a Japa walk in that morning before earlier. 
And I noticed in the area where the fireworks, there were still these pieces of paper where the fireworks went off and there was that you know, debris from the fireworks. I mentioned it to him. Immediately, he called over his temple president, the pre temple president, not just anybody. He said, check this out and get this clean right away. He was really concerned. And within a few hours, that place was clean. That's how, that's the consciousness. So clean. Like that. So that's, that takes a while to establish. But once you do it, it's amazing. Part of keeping things clean is not having excess, you know. If you have excess, have a place for storage. Mm. Like, that. like that. And that keeps down disease. When it's, everything's clean, it's less likely of sicknesses, mm. especially in the warm weather. Like that. So, like that. anyway, thanks for the question. I hope I didn't say anything wrong. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai Shri Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Bo Hari Bo.